and inspired how God has brought the the service together. Um, and there's a lot of that that would tie into the message, but I think especially of verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And also our Sunday school lesson ties in, but we'll leave that for now. So just bless how God, God has led. In the past week or so going through the ordination I was pondering, I guess, what I should preach this morning, whether I should go back to Matthew 5 or whether I should have some kind of post-ordination message. And I felt like maybe I should have something like a post-ordination message. I wasn't quite sure where I'd go with that. And then I came to the realization that I think I can go back to Matthew 5 and do them both with the same message. And so that is, that is where I have chosen to go this morning. However, I might just share a few thoughts, first of all, and, and here I'm just sharing, I guess, from my own experience, my own heart, what I see in my own life, because I really don't know what you all have experienced. But as we were coming up to the ordination and seeking God's face and spending a lot of time in prayer and asking God to reveal His will, and we believe God has done that, and, but now where do we go from here? Is that done now? It's over and now we can just go on with life. Or I guess for you know, some of you who aren't ordained, what did you feel? What did you experience? Um, probably some nervousness. But also that of, you know, what, you know, what if God would call me? You know, what changes would I need to make? Or how would I fit that calling into my schedule? But whew, that's past now, you know, and that's, that's taken care of, now life can go on. Is that really the case? Is that how it should be? I don't believe it is, and I would like to, I guess, call, and I, I don't know what you, like I said, I'm only, I'm only showing you how I think and how I act sometimes. But, you know, we sit in meetings and we're inspired, or I sit here at church and I'm like, Wow, I'm gonna to have to make some changes in my life. I'm gonna to have to change my priorities, my schedules. You know, this is. And then comes Monday, and you know, to, and then soon you're back in the same rut again. And is that the way we are? Is that the way we're going to? Um, is that the way we're doing? Or is there something better? Has God called each one of us, given each one of us a calling? I believe He has. And what? What adjustments would I be willing to make if he'd have called me to the ministry? And am I willing to make some adjustments to adapt to the calling that God has for me? I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. That's a, just a burden I have on my heart. Is, am I still seeking God's face? Am I still ready to serve him wherever he has called me? Or is life just returning back to normal for most of us? So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, continuing with the Sermon on the Mount. Last time we had looked at the salt of the earth, and I would love to spend some time just reviewing that, but I don't think we'll take much time to do that, but simply God calling us to be the salt the, the preserving factor. Um, also, we had, we had noticed how God had asked the Israelites to salt all their sacrifices. And salt was something that spoke of commitment and faithfulness. God asking the Israelites for a commitment of faithfulness to Him. And then we are called to have salt one with another, being faithful to each other, keeping our word, loving our fellow man, the second commandment, loving our neighbor as ourself. And then we are also called to be salt in the fact that we are the evidence. They would put salt on their meals or salt on their promises, you know, to, to verify that this is true. This will happen with the word that I have spoken. And God is calling us to be salt of the earth. We are to be the evidence that God is God and he keeps his word and he is still changing people. 
Am I being the evidence to the world around me that God's word is true and that he has the power to save and to change my life? And now coming to verse 14, Matthew 5, verse 14, I'd like to read through verse 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The way I understand this word, the light of the world, was a term that was well understood in Jesus' day. It was a term that was used by people even before Jesus' time. And it was often used in reference to God's word or the temple or for God himself. Some of the more famous or respected rabbis were sometimes referred to as the light of the world. In John 8 verse 12, Jesus proclaimed himself to be the light of the world. He was a rabbi, but he says, he just proclaimed himself, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that followeth me. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the word of God. I am where the presence of God dwells. I am God himself. And anyone that follows me, he had disciples, he had followers, he was a rabbi. Anyone who follows me will have the light of life. That's in John 8, verse 12. And I notice the Pharisees' response. They say, "Uh uh-huh. You're just just saying that of yourself. No one else has given that record of you. That's your own record. Your record isn't true. They didn't want to accept it that Jesus was the light of the world, that he was God. And so they said, that's just your own record. It's not true. You know, in Matthew 5, Jesus gets even more radical or maybe more far-fetched in the Pharisees' eyes when he says that ye are the light of the world. Here he was speaking to his Specifically to his twelve. I believe there was a multitude around him listening. But it says he, he, he addressed his disciples. So he was speaking to the twelve. There were fishermen. There was a tax collector. I don't know what all the occupations they had. But Jesus looks at them and says, Ye are the light of the world. And they're like, Pharisees are probably like, No, no way. These lowly peasants, they're not the light of the world. But that's what Jesus said. And that's what he's calling you and me to today, to be the light of the world. God puts a lot of emphasis on light. In fact, I found it interesting that the very first record that we have of God speaking, in Genesis 1 verse 3, he says, Let there be light. And there was light. And in studying, I was just impressed with, even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is just reference after reference of speaking about God and his word being light, of Jesus being light. There's many, many references to that. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And that's what God is calling us to Are you the light of the world? Is my word God's word? Am I the dwelling place of God? Can God's spirit, does God's spirit live in me? Have I been born of the spirit? Am I a son or a daughter of God? Am I a little Christ? Romans 8 verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
If we don't have God's spirit, if we are not the light of the world, we have no fellowship with God. We are not part of his family. Ephesians 5 verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Light. Am I the light of the world? In Ephesians, or sorry, not in Ephesians, going back to our Matthew chapter 5, the second phrase there, he says, first is, ye are the light of the world, and then he says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, I don't know what Jesus, I don't know what Jesus saw, I don't know what the multitude saw as they sat there and listened to him speak, as they sat on the Mount of Beatitudes, but it is it is believed that where he sat, it would be quite possible that he could have seen the city of Safed, which was about six miles away, but it was a couple thousand feet higher in altitude than where he was. In fact, it's, a, it's a highest, the city of the highest elevation in the sur- surrounding Galilee or Jerusalem area there. So possibly, I don't know, but it seems to me very reasonable to think that as Jesus sat there and taught, he either saw the city of Safed, or it was called different back in that day, or some other city up on a hill. And he says, ye, or no, first of all, he says, ye are the light of the world. But then he says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And as the multitude looked up there, there was no question. There was a city. People could see for miles around. And Jesus doesn't make a lot of comments on it. He just says a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Perhaps Jesus was referring to the church. I don't know exactly what he was referring to. But perhaps he was referring to the church. A whole city of lights on a hill. And that light cannot be hid. You know, the, you know the, what it looks like if you, we don't really hear in Indiana, but depending where you travel, at nighttime you see the mountains, you see the hills, and up there somewhere on top is a whole city of lights. And it can't be hid. There's, there's no way to hide it. The whole world can see where that city is. And depending on your, the situation, it would be an assurance. It would be a comfort to see those lights and to know that there is, there is refuge close by. That's what the church should be like. It should be a landmark, a reference point, a place of refuge and safety. It should stand out tall and strong above the world around them. And when the surroundings are dark, the city will give much light to the world. Am I outstanding? Is it easy to spot me from the rest of the world? Is my light shining in the darkness? Going on to verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. You know, I think all of us have been guilty of doing that at times. But God doesn't need any secret agents. He doesn't need any Christians. They said, but I just want you to keep it undercover a little bit. I got a work for you to do. And just keep it undercover. Don't tell anybody. God doesn't need followers like that. He says, we don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. I brought a candle along this morning. I think we're familiar with candles.
Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Now, especially the ladies, they light candles. And so sometimes we come into the house and there's a candle burning, and we understand that. But probably we wouldn't understand so much if we'd come into the house and it would look like that. You know, why would we light a candle and cover it with a bushel or with a basket? Jesus said, that's not the way men do. Why should we hide our light? You know, who gives us our light? Is the light something we generate ourselves? Is that something that we determine whether we will let it shine or whether we will cover it? No, the light is from God. And how must God feel when he gives us light? And then we're kind of ashamed, so we just cover it up. Secondly, what happens when we cover our light? You know, that's the sad thing about covering our light. It goes out. When we try to cover our light, or when we do cover our light, it doesn't take long until that flame is extinguished. We cannot be a secret agent for God and expect to continue to have that light burning inside us. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know, that's kind of sounds like Peter. He had a passion for God. He loved God. He said, I'll, I'll die with you. I'll do anything for you. But you know, there came a time, and I, he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit yet, but there came a time in his life where he was like, no, I don't know the man. I don't, I don't even know who you're talking about. I know. I, I don't know the man. And he cursed and he swore. He didn't want to be identified. He wanted to cover it. But when we cover our light, it goes out. And I thank God that Peter allowed Jesus to light that fire again. He repented, and he allowed Jesus to give him light again. And giveth light unto all that are within the house. We light the candle, and it gives light to all that are in the house. You know, if our light isn't visible to those in our own house, we probably don't have a light at all. Now, I know it's true. It's been said that we usually hurt worse the people we like the most or we love the most. There's a lot of truth to that because the people that we love the most, or I hope that's the people of our own family, the people that we're with every day, you know, they, we, can't, we can't wear our suit coat the whole time. We can't wear our best clothes the whole time. And, and so they see some of our our dirty spots. They see some of our rough edges. And so, yes, it's true that probably they'll get, they'll get hurt even before some of the others will. But if the people in our own house don't see our light, then I would have a question. Are the people outside of our house seeing a light? Of Jesus? Or is it some kind of light that I have fabricated? You know, I can actually make a light that I can kind of hold up by doing the right things, and I can trick most of you most of the time if I'm not around you too much. But that's not the light of Jesus. Because the light of Jesus is there in my house, outside of my house, when no one is watching, when people are watching. So I'd simply have us ask ourselves that question. Do the people inside my house see my light? And if they don't, then do I have a light at all?
You know, Satan is also able to produce things that look like light. He does that to deceive ourselves because he wants us to think that we have light when we don't. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself has the ability to look like light, but it's a false light. To deceive us. To deceive others. To make others think that he is the light of the world. He has everything to offer. But his light is not true and it, it does not last. The next phrase, verse 16, let your light so shine before men. And I've chosen that for the title of the message. Let your light so shine. How should it shine? Like a candle. That is put on a candlestick and that gives light to everyone around it. Just let it shine. Let it shine. It should shine for everyone we have contact with. You know, a candle that's lit, it doesn't care who's in the audience. It doesn't care who walks by it. It's always giving light. Always giving light. Consistent. It doesn't flicker and go out. You know, sometimes we have those light bulbs that are on sometimes, and depending how they rattle, they go off, and then they come back on again. That's not the light from the Holy Spirit. He doesn't, his light doesn't flicker. I think if we'd be honest, we just have to admit that when our light goes out, or when it's not obvious to those around us, then we have at least momentarily lost our light. The Holy Spirit is not guiding our light if the light is not obvious to those around us because His light always shines. His light always shines. Evidently, we're listening to another spirit and we need to get God's Spirit controlling our life again. So let your light shine. Revelation 2.5 says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove your lamp from its place, unless you repent. Unless you repent. And then, good works. Good works. That's not a good subject. A lot of people don't want to hear about good works. They say it's about faith. It's about my relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about works. But it doesn't say that people may um, see your faith, your good faith, and they will glorify your Father in heaven. It talks about works. Our light produces something. It gives light. It produces works. It illuminates. You know, it's not the Old Testament had focused a lot on works, but the New Testament does too. It's very clear that unless our works demonstrate our faith, we will not experience an eternity in heaven. And if I think that works has nothing to do with my salvation then I have been deceived by the father of lies. Because God is concerned about our works. He will judge us by our works. You know, Satan is pleased if we, if we think that all we have to do is believe. Works is not part of the equation. All we have to do is believe. But he is also pleased... If I think, well, I just have to try harder. You know, I have to produce more works. I, yesterday, I, you know, I kind of messed up, and so I have to try harder to, you know, to be kind, um, to be loving. I just have to try harder. He's also pleased with that because our light does not come from ourselves. No effort that I can put into that will make my light shine. 
My light needs to come from Jesus living inside of me. His presence in my life. We are the light of the world. We are the dwelling place for God. We can't try to fix our light by trying to do better. The light comes from the Father of lights, and only His Spirit can give us more light. You know, sometimes, or we could think of our light or of ourselves as being the moon, and Jesus or God being the sun. And you could take it there, make it the sun, put an O in there instead of the U. And as the sun shines, I am the moon, and I reflect his glory. I cannot, I cannot produce any light of myself, but I only reflect his glory But the moon is always reflecting. Now, it is true that sometimes I can't see the moon. But it doesn't change the fact. He's reflecting the light of the sun. He's always reflecting the light of the sun. There's only one time, only one situation, where perhaps you could say that the moon does not reflect the light of the sun. Does someone know when that is? In an eclipse. When the world gets in between the sun and the moon, it quits. It stops reflecting, or at least it really hinders its reflection. And my friends, when the world gets in between me and the sun, I lose my light. I lose my light. Acts 1, 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in your own house, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Ye shall receive power. If the Holy Ghost is living in me, I will have a light. I will have power. And I will be a witness. I will not be covered. No. I will be a witness, a light that all can see. God help us to get that uncovered before our light goes out. But it comes from God within and not from our own power. And then the last phrase there. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our light, our good works are not to bring any credit to myself, not for any personal gain or glory, but to glorify my Father, to glorify the light itself, the Son who has given us the light. He is the one who gave it to us, and He deserves all the glory. So, what are some hindrances? that keep our light from shining. What are some hindrances? Jesus gave the parable of the sower. And in that parable, he said, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. So what are the cares of this world? The pressures of life. You know, it's the worry about how we will pay our next rent bill or taxes or phone bill or whatever. It's the cares of this life. It's the worries, the anxieties, the responsibilities. Do I let them take out my light? I'll have to confess that there are times where I have. You know, there are times where the cares of life, you know, equipment breaks down and and things go wrong. And then I come into the house and then, well, you know, 
children are, well, my children don't usually squabble, but the children are squabbling or, or something, you know, supper isn't ready. And, and the next thing I know, I, you know, I snap at someone or I say an unkind word. I have allowed the cares of this world to put out my light. The cares of this world to cover my light, yes, even put it out. But that's not from God. That's not from God. That's from Satan to bring things into my life. Here the other day as I was preparing for this message, I was praying, I was asking God to help me let my light shine so that the, you know, the world around me could see the light, his light in me. And I think I, it wasn't an audible voice, but I, it came to my mind and I think it was from God as clear as, it, as if it would have been audible. And this is, what, this is what I heard. That's why. That's why. And I'll just back up a little bit. Some of you know this, this past year in, in, in my business life has been kind of a struggle. There's been lots of breakdowns and it seemed it's just a, a continual struggle. Just problems that keep resurfacing. And it was like I heard him say, that's why. I have allowed you troubles in your life. That's why I let your employee quit on you in a busy time. That's why I allow difficult things into your life so that you can let your light shine. So that the world can see me and you. And I know I've not always been faithful in that. Here a couple weeks ago, I was corresponding with an, an auditor that wanted to try and figure out if I was paying all my taxes. And from their viewpoint, they didn't think I was. And I was a little frustrated by the whole situation. And I'm not going to take time to go into detail, but... I had voluntarily chose to pay these taxes. It was on personal property. No one told me I have to. And I, eventually, years ago, I would found out that some people do, some people don't. And I finally felt convicted, and so I started paying these personal property taxes. And now an auditor comes knocking on my door and trying to, um, anyway, yeah, to see if I am paying my taxes. And it was a little frustrating. I had reasons I recorded things the way I did, and I had answers for it, but they did, she didn't understand that. And I just pled to, I said, I need to keep paying my bills. I got work to do. I'm busy. Can't you please let me go? And, and, you know, but she didn't accept that. And she disagreed with some of the things I had. She wanted me to pay taxes on things that didn't even exist. And I got frustrated after about the third time. And I sent her an email back, and yeah, she knew I was frustrated. And I told her I'm not paying taxes on something that didn't even exist. I didn't own, I didn't, I mean, that's, it says right on the paper I'm supposed to pay taxes on things in my possession that I'm using to make a living or to make a, make a profit. I said, I, I, this thing didn't even exist. I didn't own it. It didn't even exist. I'm not paying taxes on it. And I went back out, and I continued working, and I don't know, there was... There was a spirit that was lurking inside that didn't quite feel right, and God was kind of nudging me a little bit, but I still wasn't ready to back down. <laughs> and later on, I came into the house, and my wife had read the email, and she said, uh, she doesn't feel the best about what I wrote. Sometimes we need our women to, to help us let our light shine. I knew it wasn't right, so I, I wrote an email back, and I apologized. I said, I'm sorry. I was frustrated. I shouldn't have said what I did. I don't understand this, but I shouldn't have said what I did. So I'm simply confessing that sometimes the cares of this world 
It's real. They can put out our light. But we dare not leave it there. We dare not leave it there. God has given us a light so that it can shine. And we need to go back. We need to repent. We need to make it right before that light goes out. And if it does go out, then we need to ask God to light that fire again. The cares of this world, the busyness of life, sometimes can take away our light, but we dare not let it. The deceitfulness of riches can also take away our light. That reminds me, I could tell you another story, but I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll take the time. But the deceitfulness of riches, sometimes it's just a few dollars that can snuff out our life. You remember, okay, I talked about the, the sun and the moon. This not maybe not quite a true picture about our light. It's maybe not quite right because we reflect, the moon reflects. But when it comes to us and our light, it goes a step further. We're not just reflecting the glory of God. God isn't up there and we're down here and so we reflect. No, God actually comes and he lives inside of us. And so now we are producing light. I don't know if I can do this or not with the light burning. Well, I don't think I can very well. But the candle is the light. I would like to think of us as simply being the glass bull. We are only the glass bull. And our life re well, reflects. It allows the world and those around us to see what is actually inside of us. And so whatever I have inside of here is going to be obvious. If it's light, then obviously I have the Spirit of God in me. But if there isn't light, there's another spirit in there. But sometimes the deceitfulness of riches, just like the world coming between the moon and the sun blocks the light, sometimes the deceitfulness of riches can also come between me and the light and can block out the light. And I have seen that as well. I've experienced that in my own life where I allowed the deceitfulness of riches to dampen my light. Let's not allow a few dollars, whether it's on our taxes, whether it's on, you know, sometimes we're, life isn't fair. You know, sometimes we get charged double or we get charged more than what it should have been or they forget to take, give us the discount. And sometimes they're nice about that if we go back and sometimes they're not nice about that. And sometimes you just, I've already had where I wanted so badly to have what I deserve. It's my right. But how far do you push that? Or do I want to let my light shine? Someone has said, we really don't want what we deserve. Or the lust of other things. The lust of other things. I should, I'd like to, one thing I skipped. On the, on the thing of the cares of this world. You know, when I worry, and I've done way too much of this. But when I worry, I am assuming a responsibility that doesn't belong to me. It is, if I am God's child, he promises to take care of me. And I, when I worry, I'm actually reducing God down to some little godling that can't really provide for me. And so I need to take care of it because he can't do it. 
Let's not let worry choke out our light. Now coming on to the lust of other things entering in. The lust of other things. You know, this isn't necessarily talking about immorality, although it, it could include that. But it means a longing or an intense desire for something, especially something that's forbidden. You know, maybe this is too practical and comes too close to home. But I believe that there are many who choke out their light because they resist the church standards. You know, they always long for something just, about, you know, just on the other side of the fence. And it eats away. It controls their life. But it's just an intense longing for something just over there. And then if the line is moved over there, then it's just on the other side of the fence. You know, I have some goats that understand the authority of a fence. And they can enjoy all day just eating inside the fence and just grazing. And, and they enjoy life. They seem quite contented. But I have others that don't respect the fence. And they have this intense longing for something on the other side. And I have one that will spend hours of his life, hours of a day, trapped in the fence because he has this intense longing to reach over to the other side. And he's not smart enough to know how to get back out. And so he'll spend hours on end, sometimes all night, in the fence. And he can't learn. The next day he's back in the fence again. I think it has snuffed out his life. <laughs> and actually I, have actually, I have had one that actually took its life because of that. It finally hung itself and snuffed out its life because it so badly wanted what was on the other side. I've seen a goat reach through the fence and then it got tired over there and so it reached back through the fence again and it was stuck there and all it could do was eat the grass by its own front feet. But it came from an intense longing to have what's on the other side of the fence. But I think sometimes as people we have the same problem. You know, oh my, God wouldn't have to remind me of all these things. But I just remember when I was a youth in Bible, I don't know, I shouldn't even say this, but I might as well. When I was a youth in Bible school, there were a couple of us that one night, I think we were just going to get up after we were supposed to be in bed. Just, I don't know, I, I forget what we are going to do, but just get out of bed and just... And someone asked... I'm not sure if they asked me or if they asked one of my friends, why do you even want to do it? Well, because, you know, the rules say we can't. So we want to do it. I hope I didn't put any ideas in anybody's mind because it doesn't bring any fulfillment. But that is the way we are sometimes. We just want to do it because that's, that's the rules. We want to break the rules or just beyond the rules is, is what I want. That would make me happy. That intense longing for other things. And I've seen people hop churches and not find fulfillment in life. And I believe it's simply because of that intense longing. Fulfillment is somewhere out there. I need a little bit more. And so I keep pushing the fence, keep pushing the fence. The lust of other things will choke out our light. Let's enjoy what God has given us. Inside the, the, the structure, the safety of the church, rather than longing for what's out there. Well, I'd like to look just very briefly at some practical ways to let our light shine. So my first thought is, so how can we make our light shine? That's the first mistake. How can we let our light shine? So my first thought is, well, you know, I need to be kind. I need to put others ahead of myself. But remember, we don't make our light shine. It's not something that I do to make my light shine. And so this is a practical ways I would give 
this morning to let our light shine. Spend much time in prayer and fellowship with God. The light is not mine. The light is the Father's. And so how can I let my light shine? By spending time with Him. We become like the people we spend time with. You know, I am not embarrassed to say this morning that after 19 years of marriage, I am starting to become like my wife. And sometimes we think the same thing and we start saying the same thing. And I actually find pleasure in that. But if I spend time with God, I become like him too. And I should not be ashamed of that either. I should not be ashamed of that. But I want to let my light shine. So if I need more light, I need to spend more time with him. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is the light. And Proverbs 6, 23, For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. If I want my light to shine... Spend time in God's word. Spend much time in prayer and fellowship with God. Ask God to fill you with his spirit and to transform you into his image. Because his presence in my life is the only possible way that I can let my light shine. I can't make it shine. And I'll admit there are times where my light doesn't shine like it should. But I need to recognize where the light comes from. And I need to go back. And I need to tell God, I'm sorry. I covered your light. And please help me to be more like you. Fill me with your spirit, God. Even in these difficult times. Even when people don't understand. Even when people are obnoxious. Or use me unfairly. I want your light. To shine through me in the difficult times. So let your light shine. That people can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's kneel for prayer. Father, thank you for your many blessings to us this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for your light, that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Father, I pray this morning that our light would not be put out by the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, or the lust of other things, or whatever other thing that the devil might bring into our life to hide the light that you have given us. Father, I just pray that you would take this message and you would minister to each one of our needs. And in the coming weeks, I just pray you would impress us with the calling to let your light shine. And I pray that your spirit would fill each one of us. And even through the difficult times, through the trials of life, through the uncertainties or whatever we're facing as we climb our mountains, Father, Help us to trust you and to allow you, your glory, to shine through us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I trust in God, I trust in God, He cares for me. On mountain bleak or on dark sea, the stormy sea, the billows roll, He keeps my soul. Oh, my Father watches over, watches over. Trust in God wherever I may be. Upon the land or on the rolling sea. For come what may, from day to day, my heavenly Father watches over. I trust in God, I trust in God, He cares for me. On mountain, on mountain bleak or on the sun, see the stormy sea, the billows, billows roll, He keeps my soul, my, my Father watches over. to my mind what is waiting